This is Jennifer Gonzalez welcoming you to episode 148 of the Cult of Pedagogy podcast. In this episode, I'm going to give you an overview of my favorite method for planning lessons, backward design. When I taught seventh grade language arts, one of my favorite things to teach was S.E. Hinton's book, The Outsiders. Every year we began the unit with a discussion about the cliques that formed in students' lives, how these groups interacted, the unwritten rules that govern their behavior, and what happened when groups clashed or people formed relationships across group lines. After we did some reflecting, writing, and talking, we were ready to start the book. The reading went fine, more or less. Some chapters we did in class, I would read to them, they would read silently, and others students read at home. Some students became as absorbed in the novel as I'd hoped they would, and others not so much. Predictably, some fell behind in the book like they did with all assigned reading. I checked students' progress with occasional quizzes. We did some work on plot and character, setting and theme, and then after a unit test over the whole book, containing mostly questions that asked students to identify character, setting, and key plot points, we spent nearly three class periods watching Francis Ford Coppola's movie version of the book, and I got to drool over Matt Dillon in the movie's opening scene again and again and again. From start to finish, the whole unit took about three weeks. In retrospect, I'm not sure why it was my favorite. Seriously, I mean, even though I loved the book, my students' response to it was mostly lukewarm. Maybe it was just the idea of teaching it that I loved. Maybe it was the connections I was able to make to the stuff students dealt with on a day-to-day basis. I don't know. I taught that book a few times, and even though I looked forward to it every time, I always finished the unit a little unsatisfied. And it's only now, years later, that I'm starting to understand that dissatisfaction. I can't say with any confidence that my students actually learned something from that unit. Upon deeper reflection, I'm not confident that any of my students learned anything of lasting value from at least half the lessons I taught. This is a hard pill to swallow because I wasn't half bad as a teacher. I had decent relationships with my students, and I believe most of them had good experiences in my classroom. But real, durable learning? I can't say how much of that actually happened. I don't love admitting that. But at least now I understand why my teaching didn't produce a lot of actual learning. I never set clear, measurable learning targets. Things would have been so different if I'd known about backward design. In this episode, I'm going to review the basics of backward design, an approach to lesson planning that I believe all teachers should be practicing. Before we get started, I want to thank PowerSchool for sponsoring this episode. PowerSchool knows that teachers go above and beyond for students. But teachers need help too, especially as they're asked to do more every day. That's why PowerSchool, now with Schoology, combines SIS, LMS, and assessment technology, empowering teachers with more time for what really matters. Visit powerschool.com slash time for teachers to find out how teachers are using technology to unlock student success. That's powerschool.com slash time for teachers. Support also comes from ISTU. Sharpen your skills and learn to accelerate innovation in your school or learning community when you take a course from ISTU. These flexible online courses put pedagogy first, and they're built to help educators, librarians, tech coaches, and leaders develop digital competencies and advance their careers by exploring critical topics in education, like project-based learning, game-based learning, the learning sciences, and ensuring equity and inclusion in online learning. Choose the topic and time commitment that fit your needs. Learn more at isti.org slash cult. That's isti, I-S-T-E, dot org slash cult. Now, let's get started with backward design. 
When teachers talk to each other about the stuff they're teaching, they often say things like this. What novels do you do in eighth grade? Or, oh, that'll be perfect. I can use this when I teach the American Revolution. Or, I don't think I can fit that in. We're doing moon phases next month. We tend to talk about our teaching plans in terms of the broad topics we cover. This shorthand is practical. We're not going to drill down into specific skill and knowledge objectives while waiting our turn at the bagel table. But when I think about the lessons I gave my students, the ones I observed in my colleagues' classrooms, and the work I've seen my own children do, I think this shorthand might be a pretty fair representation of what many of us are still doing, churning out lessons that keep students busy with our content without ever getting clear about what we want them to learn. Instead of starting with a topic, we would do better if we start with an end goal. And that's where backward design comes in. So first, let's look at the difference between traditional versus backward planning. First, we'll look at traditional lesson design. For many years, teachers have been planning lessons and units of instruction like this. Step one, identify a topic or chunk of content that needs to be covered. Step two, plan a sequence of lessons to teach that content. And step three, create an assessment to measure the learning that should have taken place in those lessons. Notice that in this approach, the assessment is created after the lessons are planned. Sometimes it isn't created until most of those lessons have already taken place. The assessment is kind of an afterthought, a check to see if students were paying attention to the stuff we taught them. For most of my teaching career, this is how I planned. It's presumably how most of my colleagues planned. I believe it's still how many teachers plan. So what's wrong with it? Well, when we plan this way, we're more likely to include content and activities that have questionable value. When teaching the American Revolution, for example, if our goal is just to, quote, teach about the American Revolution, we can throw in anything that has any relation to that topic, a coloring page of the Boston Tea Party, a colonial flag craft project, or a worksheet where students unscramble words like Minuteman, Independence, and Hancock. This random approach creates two problems. The first and most important problem is a lack of durable, transferable learning. One reason so many of us don't remember much of what we learned in school is that we learned it through this haphazard, topic-driven approach. These random activities are taking up precious time that could be spent on much more valuable stuff. The other problem is poor student engagement. Our students know when they're being asked to do something pointless. If they don't see the relevance of what they're learning or a direct line between the content of your course and a desirable outcome, they're likely to tune it out. Sure, many students will do what you ask anyway because they want good grades and the benefits that come from them, but they're not learning. If you don't believe me, ask them. So that's traditional lesson design. That's how many of us used to plan, maybe still do. That's how teachers sort of throughout history have tended to plan lessons. Now we'll look at backward design and how that differs. First, I want to give credit to the people who came up with backward design uh, in an education context. In their book, Understanding by Design, which was originally published in 1998, Grant Wiggins and Jay McTie introduced us to backward design, an approach to instructional planning that starts with the end goal and then works backward from there. Here are the steps of backward design. Step one, identify what students should know and be able to do by the end of the learning cycle. Step two, create an assessment to measure that learning. And step three, Plan a sequence of lessons that will prepare students to successfully complete the assessment. The difference in order is significant. Plan the assessment first. Then plan only lessons that will contribute to student success on that assessment. 
When I was first introduced to this concept in my sixth year of teaching, the genius of it completely blew me away. I used it when I planned my next unit and I experienced the biggest spike in student success I had ever seen. On top of that, I was actually excited about teaching the lessons I had planned. For the first time, it felt like none of my class was wasted. Everything we did actually mattered. There was something a lot more satisfying about doing things this way. Let's take a look at an example to illustrate the difference between a unit planned the traditional topic-driven way and the same unit planned with backward design. It's going to be a before and after, and the topic that we're going to be using, the content, is going to be science. This is going to be the lunar cycle. So in the before version, the final product of the unit is a test, okay? So a typical way that a teacher, and we're going to sort of imagine that this is kind of like middle school level. That way, if you're an elementary teacher, you can kind of adjust down mentally. And if you are a high school teacher, you can slightly adjust up. I'm sort of shooting for the middle here with this example. Okay, so a pretty typical way to teach the moon phases or the lunar cycle is as follows. Start with a lecture or a video that teaches the phases of the moon, followed by something like a worksheet that students do to label the phases. Then maybe some sort of interactive activity, like scraping the filling out of Oreos to represent the different phases. Then uh, maybe following a teacher's sample, students create a physical model of the moon phases using something like styrofoam balls. Um, and in this case, the students' models are all pretty much the same as each other, and they're, they're kind of copying the teacher's model. Finally, there is a unit test that requires students to label the phases of the moon from memory and answer multiple choice questions about the lunar cycle, eclipses, and seasons. In many classrooms, teachers also have students track the appearance of the moon over the course of a month, so that might also be added to all of this as well. Following this plan, a teacher would feel pretty satisfied that they covered the topic of moon phases. But if we look at the next generation science standards, the standard relating to moon phases says this. Students will develop and use a model of the Earth-Sun-Moon system to describe the cyclic patterns of lunar phases, eclipses of the sun and moon, and seasons. Note the language here. Students are meant to develop a model, then use it to describe these patterns. But in the plan I just described for you, students merely copied a model, and they didn't use it to describe anything. Even if the model required some written captioning to explain what was going on, because the model was a copy, it can't be safely said that students were really the ones describing the system. Then there's the test. If we assume that a large portion of a student's grade is based on the test, then students are not being measured on their achievement of that standard. The standard does not require students to memorize the phases of the moon, nor does it ask them to, quote, demonstrate knowledge of how the whole system works. The standard wants students to develop a model and use it to describe the system. Now, it would be easy to blow off this distinction, to say, bah, same difference. Tess asks students a lot of questions that would show an understanding of these concepts, so we're covered. But not really. Asking a person to develop a model is a much higher order task than asking them to copy a model. Describing systems and patterns is way more challenging than selecting the correct description. Developing models and explaining things is the work of real scientists. They notice phenomena, study it, then figure out how to represent those phenomena in order to make it clear to other people. To say, look at this, it's interesting, and it explains why things are the way they are. And that is exactly what the NGSS authors had in mind. This is a quote from one of their documents. Any education that focuses predominantly on the detailed products of scientific labor, the facts of science, without developing an understanding of how those facts were established, or that ignores the many important applications of science in the world, 
misrepresents science and marginalizes the importance of engineering. In other words, a superior education will teach students to think and practice like scientists. If we don't plan learning experiences that make that possible, we're giving them a subpar education. So here is the after version. If we redo this unit plan with backward design, we'll need to start by developing an assessment that would measure success with that standard. That means the assessment would not be a test where students merely label the moon phases, but a student developed model of the moon phases along with some kind of presentation where students use that model to explain lunar phases, eclipses, and seasons. When designing this final assessment, it's essential that the teacher crafts a rubric that clearly outlines specific high standards for both the model and presentation. The rubric should list criteria for the accuracy and functionality of the model, plus the quality of the presentation itself. And if you go over to Cult of Pedagogy, click podcast and go to episode 148, I've got sort of an image there of, a, of an example of a rubric that would give a really detailed list of criteria that require this model itself to be accurate and include certain pieces of information and for the presentation itself to really explain all of these systems very clearly. Once you have a good rubric in place, then work backwards to determine what lessons students need to do excellent work on that final assessment. So, the first step would be still some direct instruction. Students still need to know the basics of the lunar system. Memorization is not the goal, so we're not grading for that, but students do need to know the information well enough to explain it and use the right vocabulary. So we can keep the lecture or the video from the original plan. And having them work with the information a bit on some kind of worksheet or with some kind of online practice is fine. But I wouldn't give points for this work. If you need to motivate students to do it, then require them to demonstrate proficiency maybe in the content before they can move to the next step. One uh, strategy for doing this that I really like would be using the app Quizlet, which is a flashcard app. You can send students to a deck of Quizlet flashcards, either that you create yourself or that you get from another resource on Quizlet. There's a lot of decks that you can just borrow and use for your own use. And I've actually linked to one over here on the blog post. Students could study these flashcards for a little while and then they can play these games with Quizlet where the Quizlet will like mix up the cards and then you have to match the words with their definition. Maybe you just say to your students, okay, until you get 80% on that, you can't move to the next thing. So it's not a grade that has to go into your grade book. They just have to show you that they were able to do this with 80% proficiency, which means they have a pretty good idea of what these lunar phases look like and what they mean and what the, you know, the different vocabulary words mean. That just means they have the tools that they need to do the next step. The next step would be active processing with models. So this is where you would give students a chance to work with a model just so that they can experience the cycle in action. They've seen it from someone else explaining it to them, but now give them a way to experience it themselves. Doing this is going to deepen their understanding of the Earth-Sun-Moon system, and that will better prepare them to give their own presentations. So another thing that I've linked to over on the blog post is an interactive model from CK through 12, which is free. And this is something that's web-based. It's online. It's a setup of the lunar system, and it allows students to manipulate the time of day and the position of the moon to see how these variables change what we see in the sky. So one thing you could do is have students work in small groups and use that simulator to answer a couple of questions about, you know, what does the moon li look like when it's in this phase and, at, you know, at this time of day? Or where would it appear in the sky if it's in this phase and, and it's, you know, 9 p.m. or it's noon or something like that? And then maybe transition into, instead of them just using the simulator, have them stop, make a prediction of where they think it is, discuss it with their group, then use the simulator to check and see if they got it right. So they're just, they're doing some active processing to really get a better understanding of this system. Once they've done this, 
the next step would be practicing actually explaining it like a a practice presentation. If they're going to do well on that final presentation, they will need practice in explaining the lunar cycle in their own words. So for this, you can just give them an existing model, like the interactive that I mentioned in the last step, or it could even be, you know, a diagram or something, but have them take turns explaining the lunar phases, including information about the seasons and eclipses to a partner or a small group. Meanwhile, ask the listening partners to coach the presenter if that description has any holes or inaccuracies. Hearing their peers explain the system, along with attempting the explanation themselves, will help them use the language of the lunar cycle a lot more fluently. So notice, everything that we're doing is with this final presentation in mind. So one more step before they're done, you know, with their their actual presentation, which is the actual model development. The standard notice does not specify that this has to be a physical model. So you could offer students a lot of different choices. The model could be, you know, made with styrofoam balls, but it could also be a hand-drawn diagram. It could be a slideshow presentation. It could be an animated video, a children's book, or even a short skit that they present to the class or record on video. Many of these options, like the children's book, for example, include the presentation piece right along with the model. So give students lots of choices. Always leave open the possibility that they'll come up with something else on their own, too. And then give them time in class to actually work on these models. Doing it in class, or at least doing a good part of it in class, will ensure that they do their own work, and it will allow you to give them feedback if a student is heading in the wrong direction. It'll also allow you to check to see if a student has bitten off more than they can chew. If they've taken on a project that, you know, if everybody else's model is going to take them one or two class periods to complete, and you're seeing that this student is probably going to take about a week or two, they might need to be redirected to choose something that's going to fit better in the available time. While the students are working, remind them regularly that the explanation of the model is nearly half of their grade. So they should consider scripting that out if their presentation is going to be live as opposed to, you know, recorded or, you know, a, a written explanation. The final step is the actual presentations of the models. If you have a lot of students who opt to give a live presentation, This could take several class periods, and that could be pretty mind-numbing since the subject matter is exactly the same for everyone. The models will, you know, be a little different, but we're basically talking about the lunar phases over and over and over again. So I would not take that as an option because that's really not a good learning opportunity to listen to 30 model presentations. To cut down on that overall time, only have students present to the whole class if the class is actually participating in the model, like maybe they've come up with some sort of skit or a simulation where everybody has to actually get up and do something. Otherwise, students can record their presentations on video. Even if it's supposed to be a live presentation, they could just like use a smartphone to record them talking through their model. Or they could just present to you one-on-one while their classmates are working on something else independently. Just because we say that a student is presenting something, it does not mean that the presentation always has to be done in front of a large audience. Even an audience of one is still, they're still kind of on stage. So that is an option. I can remember spending lots and lots of class time sometimes when students were giving presentations and it it could gobble up a lot of time. So you just want to be thoughtful about that. So with this after version, Every lesson in this learning cycle is designed to prepare students to give excellent presentations at the end. Meanwhile, the whole time, they're using the lunar cycle vocabulary, they're correcting each other's misconceptions, and just like scientists, they're thinking about how to explain concepts to other people. So some of the activities that students do in the second version are similar to what they do in the first But there are some that are missing and there are new things that are added and the intention is to to have a really, really high quality result at the end. So that was just one small unit for a middle school science class and that's the one that we did a deep dive on and looked really, really closely at it. So 
chances are many of the people listening teach something else. So what I'm going to do is just give you a couple of questions to ask about your lessons. We can sort of take this process of scrutinizing the stuff that you're doing right now um, and apply it to what you're teaching. So here is the first question. What exactly do your standards require? Do they ask students to memorize and identify facts or do they ask them to describe, explain, analyze, or create? My guess, based on looking at lots of standards, is that it is probably the latter most of the time. Sometimes I've seen standards that say students should be able to identify something or demonstrate knowledge of something. But more and more I'm seeing standards that want students to actually be doing something as opposed to just choosing something correct out of a multiple choice test. So question number two is, if it is the latter, if your standards are actually asking students to describe, explain, analyze, create, etc., how closely do your assessments measure those standards? Do they actually require students to do the describing, explaining, analyzing, or creating, which would likely require them to write, present, or create some product? Or do your assessments typically ask them to just recognize when someone else does those things in the form of an answer on a multiple choice test? Question three, do you need to adjust your assessments so they more closely align with the standards? And question four, if you do, if the answer to that last question was yes, the next step is to rework the lessons that lead up to that assessment. Does every lesson contribute to student success on that assessment? Could some of your lessons be omitted because they don't connect directly to that assessment? Are you missing anything? For example, if your assessment requires students to write in academic language and support their ideas with evidence, you should include some lessons that give students practice with that kind of writing in your content area. So the last question is, will the assessment be weighted heavily in your gradebook? It should be. The lessons and activities leading up to the final assessment are there to give students exposure to the knowledge and practice with the skills necessary to perform on that final assessment. Ideally, they should receive no grades at all on those activities. If you absolutely must assign some points, be sure the final assessment is worth a heck of a lot more than those smaller tasks because they really are formative. Like I did, you probably also have some favorite lessons and activities. Some of these might turn out to be not just fun to teach, but also solid in terms of equipping students with knowledge and skills that'll last. Now, if it turns out that those favorite lessons don't really align with any standards, you might be able to revise them so they do. Or you might keep them for other reasons. Not every minute of class time has to be spent on standards-based instruction. Some activities have value because they help us get to know each other better, they help students develop social emotional skills, or they simply offer a bit of fun. But if a lesson doesn't do any of these things, if it's disguised as learning, but is doing little more than keeping students busy, it's probably time for it to go. Using a process like backward design helps us get better at making these decisions. By making this approach part of our regular practice, we'll be able to look back on a day, a week, or a year of teaching and say with a lot more certainty that when they were under our care, our students learned. For links to all the resources mentioned in this episode, visit cultofpedagogy.com, click podcast, and choose episode 148. To get a weekly email from me about my newest blog posts, podcast episodes, courses, and products, sign up for my mailing list at cultofpedagogy.com slash subscribe. Thanks so much for listening and have a great day.